There's a lesser known niche in mathematics that sits somewhere between dynamics, combinatorics, and theoretical computer science. In symbolic dynamics, the evolution of natural systems are encoded using infinite sequences of symbols. Then these symbolic encodings can be studied to reveal information about the original objects you are interested in. In this video, I'd like to introduce you to some of the basic ideas of symbolic dynamics and raise awareness of this really interesting subfield of math as it comes up in more contexts than you might think. Symbolic dynamics is a subfield of dynamical systems, so let's begin there. A dynamical system can be a lot of things, but ultimately it's a set of possible states together with a rule that determines how one state evolves into another. We usually think of those states as points belonging to some space, and usually that rule, t, is usually thought of as a function, transformation, or map on the base space, x. What we're most interested in within dynamical systems is usually what happens to a state as we let them evolve for a very long time, looking at the limit as our time parameter approaches infinity. Do points eventually converge to some limit? Do they oscillate back and forth between two values or enter some other periodic cycle? How complicated can these possible trajectories be? Let's look at the Baker's map as an example. Suppose our state space, x, is the unit interval from 0 to 1, and our transformation, t, stretches the interval out twice as long, then cuts it in half and puts the right piece on top of the left so that it all fits on the unit interval again. This is called the baker's map because it's like stretching out a piece of bread dough, cutting it in half, and kneading the two pieces back together. We want to look at how points iterate on this map, so let's forget the y component and just think of this as a map from the x position to itself. We can pick an initial point, iterate this map on it, and see how it evolves. Depending on the point you pick, we'll see all sorts of different possible trajectories. For instance, the point 0 stays right where it is. No matter how many times we iterate, this is called a fixed point. The point 1 third goes to 2 thirds, then back to 1 third. A point that eventually returns to where it started is called periodic, and the number of iterations needed to return a point to where it started is called its period. In this case, 1 third has a period of 2. A point with a period of 1 is a fixed point. This point bounces around a bit before hitting one-third, where it then iterates between one-third and two-thirds forever. A point that eventually iterates to a periodic point is called pre-periodic. And the point pi over four seems to bounce around with no pattern at all. All of this becomes clear if we look at this system in base two. Let's look at one-third, for instance. Because one-third is less than one-half, the first binary digit in its base 2 expansion after the decimal point is zero. And because one-third is greater than one-quarter, the second binary digit is one. We subtract one-quarter from one-third and get one-twelfth. That's less than one-eighth, so the third binary digit is zero. But it's more than one-sixteenth, so the fourth binary digit is one, and so on. This is one-third in binary. Multiply it by two and you get two-thirds, which in base two is this. Multiplying by two just shifts the decimal point to the right one place, just like multiplying by 10 does in base 10. If we multiply by two again, we get four-thirds, or 1.01, .01, and subtracting one just deletes the one in the ones place, leaving one-third again. So the Baker's map T is very simple to understand if we phrase it in terms of how it acts on the base two expansion of an input point X. To obtain t of x from x, we write x in base 2, then shift that sequence to the left one place and zero out the leftmost bit if it happens to be 1. Now we can explain all the things we saw earlier just by looking at these sequences. The point 1 third has a period of 2 because shifting its base 2 expansion left 2 digits gives us back 1 third. Likewise, the base 2 expansion of our pre-periodic starting point is a sequence which, after 7 shifts, brings us to 0 0.0101, or 1 third again and the trajectory of pi over 4 never returns to where it began because pi over 4 is an irrational number, meaning its digits go on forever without ever repeating regardless of what base the number is in. To this perspective is so elegant, we can just drop all of the pretense of numbers, multiplication, and subtraction, and just work with these sequences of symbols. And so begins our first foray into symbolic dynamics proper. It all starts with an alphabet of symbols. In the case of our previous example, that alphabet was just two symbols, 0 and 1. But the alphabet could be anything. It could be all the digits from 0 to 9, it could be a set of three colors, it could even be the keys on a piano. Anything. Next, we start building sequences with these symbols. We have a zeroth symbol, a first symbol, a second symbol, and in general, a symbol for every natural number i. We use the letter capital N to denote the set of all natural numbers. 
Each particular sequence is just one way of choosing one symbol from the alphabet A for every natural number. The space of all possible sequences over the alphabet A is denoted A to the N. This is a massive space containing uncountably many sequences. We think of each one of these infinite sequences as a single point inside A to the N. You're probably already comfortable with that if you're fine with thinking of a single real number as its decimal expansion, that being an infinite sequence of the symbols 0 through 9. Now that we have a space full of points, the other component of a dynamical system is a function sigma which takes the sequence of symbols x and outputs a new sequence which is a copy of x shifted to the left with its leftmost symbol deleted. The function sigma is called the shift map and together with a to the n it forms a dynamical system known as the full shift. Returning to the Baker's map for a moment, recall that the trajectory of a point is just its base 2 expansion. We also know that every possible binary sequence is the base 2 expansion of some real number, so we know that in some sense, the Baker's map on the interval 0 to 1 and the full shift on two symbols are sort of the same dynamically. They have the same dynamical properties, having the same entropy, zeta function, and other stuff we don't have time to explain. But of course, not every dynamical system is the same. Consider a much simpler example where our base space is just two points, A and B, and T simply swaps them back and forth. The trajectory of point A is ABAB, while the trajectory of point B is BABA. We can still encode these trajectories with sequences of symbols, but only these two sequences are necessary. This dynamical system embeds in the full shift on two symbols, but it isn't all of the full shift on two symbols, making this a subsystem of the full shift. If we start with a dynamical system xt, then we can find a subsystem by choosing a subset of x, which we'll call x prime. X prime is a proper subsystem only if all the points in X prime map back to X prime when T is applied to them. In the Baker's map, for example, we could restrict X prime to only look at the rational points of the unit interval. This is a proper subsystem because the Baker's map always maps rational numbers to other rational numbers. But the Baker's map has a lot of other subsystems, uncountably many in fact, and most of them are not very obvious. Now let's look at our new best friend, the full shift. A subsystem of the full shift on two symbols would be a subset, capital X, such that for each sequence in the set, recorded as lowercase x, its shift also belongs to the set capital X. The subset X is said to be shift invariant in this case. Instead of calling X a subsystem, we can call it a subshift because it's a subsystem of the full shift. We refer to these objects as subshifts, shift spaces, or just shifts interchangeably. Subshifts are the fundamental objects of interest in the field of symbolic dynamics. We study these systems because many examples of natural, real-world dynamical systems can be encoded as symbolic spaces in the same way that the Baker's map can be encoded as the full shift on two symbols. Most often, subshifts are constructed or specified by rules. To illustrate, let's go back to our binary alphabet. Let's define a subsystem by the following rule. No two ones anywhere in the sequence are immediately adjacent to each other. The subshift specified by this rule is the set of all binary sequences which satisfy the rule. You could generate a sequence belonging to this subshift by flipping a coin infinitely many times. On heads, write 0, and on tails, write 1, 0. Then every 1 will be padded on both sides by zeros, and no 1s will be touching. This rule is shift invariant because if I start with an arbitrary sequence that doesn't contain any adjacent ones and then I shift it, it won't suddenly contain adjacent ones because all the symbols are in the same order after the shift. So we're going to label the collection of all binary sequences satisfying this rule as M. This is a huge collection containing uncountably any sequences, but it isn't every sequence in the full shift. That makes M a proper subshift of the full shift on two symbols. The subshift M is called the golden mean shift because the number of sequences of length n satisfying its rules are equal to sequential Fibonacci numbers. This is just one example of a rule generating a subshift. There are a lot of rules you could make up. How about this one? Any consecutive run of zeros after the first one must be even in length. This rule is also shift invariant, so it generates a proper subshift. The reason we have to add the caveat after the first run of zeros is because for example, the sequence starting 0, 0, 001 does satisfy a rule, but if you shift it to obtain one starting with 0, 01, then the first run of zeros is now odd in length. But if we allow for the first run of zeros to be anything, then we are safe and the rule is really shift invariant. This subshift also has a special name, the even shift. You can probably see why. Let's see an example of a rule which does not specify a subshift. The rule, the eighth symbol is zero, is not shift invariant. To see why, let's take these five example sequences. 
In some sequences, the eighth symbol is zero, but when we shift them, which ones satisfy the rule changes, because the rule isn't shift invariant. Now to be clear, there are sequences x, that x and every shift of x, all satisfy the eighth symbol is zero rule. The sequence of all zeros has that property. But a rule can only specify a subshift if every sequence that specifies the rule still satisfies the rule after you shift it. That's what it means for a rule to be shift invariant. There is one especially simple class of rules, which you might call adjacency rules, where the rules specify what symbols are allowed to be adjacent to which other symbols. The golden mean shift is an example of this, as its one and only rule is the symbol 1 is allowed to be adjacent to 0, but forbidden to be adjacent to 1. As another example, suppose our alphabet were all the digits 1 to 9. Let's imagine that a sequence over this alphabet actually encoded some sort of simple height map for a one-dimensional terrain that might be used in a platformer game. And let's assume that we don't want any cliffs that are too high to jump. Maybe one unit is fine, but two units is too high. We can capture the set of all sequences satisfying this restriction with the adjacency rule any two adjacent symbols must have a numeric difference of one or less. A sequence like this might be allowed by the rules and would therefore be part of the subshift. But a sequence like this would not be allowed because the symbols 7 and 4 are adjacent when they shouldn't be. So an adjacency rule, or one-step shift, is a rule that can be checked by only looking at adjacent pairs of symbols. A more general kind of rule is a local rule, which is one that can be checked by only looking at subsequences of some finite length. In the case of the one-step rules, that length is 2. To illustrate, let's tweak our definition of the golden mean shift by changing the rule to the symbol 1 is never closer than 3 units to another 1. This generates a subshift where, in every sequence, the ones are rather sparsely distributed. But this rule is still local because if we want to check if a sequence is allowed, we only need to look at every four symbol subsequence. We can imagine a window four units long scrolling from left to right along the sequence. Whether or not there are two ones closer than three units only depends on what is written in each of these four symbol windows. A subshift specified by a local rule, one verifiable using a window with a finite size, is called a shift of finite type, or SFT. SFTs are some of the most important examples of subshifts because they are very easy to analyze, as a lot of their properties and theorems are much easier to check or prove for SFTs than other general subshifts. If arbitrary subshifts are like real numbers, then you should think of the SFTs like rational numbers. Much neater, nicer, more well-behaved, and distributed densely in the space of all possible subshifts. So, the golden mean shift and the tweaked golden mean shift we just described, as well as the height map shift we looked at from before, are all examples of SFTs. But is the even shift an SFT? Pause for a moment if you want to think it through. It can be tricky to decide whether it is or isn't. On one hand, a run of zeros can be arbitrarily long, but on the other hand, if a run of zeros is finite in length, then surely you only have to check the subsequence of that length. In fact, the even shift is not an SFT. To see why, let's talk about imaginary math machines. Imagine you have some sequence of symbols over some alphabet, and a little machine on the sequence at some position. You might think I'm about to describe a Turing machine, but this is actually a simpler machine than that. It doesn't move left or right, it doesn't write any symbols at its position, all it can do is read the symbol in some finite interval around its position, and then print either accept or forbid, based on whether the subsequence it reads breaks a given local rule. Suddenly, you have an infinite number of these machines, one for each position on the whole sequence. Their reading windows can overlap, but they can't communicate with each other. They're all identical, and they all either print accept or forbid based on the symbols in their window. The whole infinite sequence is only accepted if every single machine, all the way down the line, prints accept. If just one machine prints forbid, then the whole entire sequence is forbidden, and it's not part of whatever subshift you're checking. We'll call these machines validators because they check whether the current sequence is valid or not under the given rule. The set of all sequences which can be checked by a local validator is a shift of finite type, an SFT. And conversely, every SFT can be described in terms of a validating machine. The golden mean shift, for instance, is very easy to describe in these terms. Imagine a machine that looks at its symbol and one immediately to the right of it. If it sees 1-1, one, one, then it prints forbid, but if it sees anything else, it prints accept. If a sequence was accepted by a row of such machines, then you would know for sure that the word 1-1 one, one did not appear anywhere in that sequence, and the sequence in question is a part of the golden mean shift. Using this description, we can also see why the even shift is not an SFT. No finite machine could ever validate every sequence in E because, whatever finite window length we choose, a sequence could always have a longer run of consecutive zeros. 
The validators also can't communicate with each other, so they can't propagate information from one end of the consecutive zero chain to the other. Now let's tweak our setup a bit. Imagine if these validators, instead of printing just forbid or accept, printed out a symbol. That symbol could belong to the same alphabet or a different one. These machines don't validate anything anymore, but if you apply all of the machines at once to some input sequence, then the output is a new sequence of symbols, possibly belonging to some subshift. This transformation from one subshift to another is called a sliding block code. You might be more familiar with this idea by a different name though, cellular automata. So a simple one-dimensional cellular automata can be thought of as a sliding block code, and all cellular automata can be studied through the lens of symbolic dynamics. The state of the automata at each time step is a sequence of white pixels and black pixels, or zeros and ones, and the evolution from a cell in one state to a cell in the next state is determined only by itself and the cells around it. Sliding block codes are the basic homomorphism between subshifts, meaning it preserves the dynamical behavior of the subshift from one setting or alphabet to another. A sliding block code can be one-to-one, -one, meaning no two input sequences code to the same output sequence. A sliding block code can also be onto, meaning that every possible sequence in the output space is the code of some sequence from the input space. If a sliding block code is both one-to-one -one and onto, we can call it a conjugacy map, or just a conjugacy. The conjugacy problem is the problem of determining whether two given dynamical systems are conjugate or not, that is, if there exists a conjugacy map between them. This is a major foundational problem in both general dynamics and symbolic dynamics specifically. And it isn't fully understood even today. It's important because if two systems are conjugate, then they have a lot of the same dynamical properties. Anything you would want to know about one system would be the same as in the other. And it might be easier to study a conjugacy of a system rather than the system itself. We've seen an example of this already as the Baker's map system and the full shift on two symbols are conjugate but the full shift on two symbols is easier to pick apart and analyze since it has a much simpler combinatorial setup. If I use these two symbols and define a subshift over this alphabet according to the rule between any two apples there must be at least one coconut, do you recognize this subshift? This is actually just the gold mean shift from earlier, but written in different terms. In a simple case like this, it's easy to tell that two subshifts are actually conjugate. But how do you tell when two general, arbitrary subshifts are conjugate or not? What do you need to know about them to be able to say one way or the other, yes they're conjugate or no they're not? That is the conjugacy problem. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go any deeper than that. We haven't even mentioned conjugacy invariants like entropy and how to calculate it, other classes of subshifts like sophic shifts or effective shifts, various mixing properties that subshifts can have, or anything specific to multidimensional symbolic dynamics where you have whole lattices full of symbols. That's where things can get really wild, but hopefully you've come away from this video with some knowledge of the basics of the field. If you'd like to learn more, check out An Introduction to Symbolic Dynamics and Codings by Lind and Marcus. This is the Bible of one-dimensional symbolic dynamics and the definitive introductory text for the field. Anyway, thanks for watching, and please check out the other videos from the competition.